Hello everyone! Up until now we used shaders just to change the color of things. However, a more dynamic and interesting shader needs some movement. To do that, we are going to use one of the most important shader built-ins, which is the UV. UVs tell us the coordinates of the current fragment or the current pixel of our object and they normally range between 0, 0 at the top left of it and 1, 1 at the bottom right of it. In order to get these coordinates, we can use the UV built-in, which can be stored in a vector too. But you might have noticed that I've been talking about these UVs as coordinates, however, I present you here with this mango-like texture, so what is this all about? Well, in shaders you cannot print things in the console just like you would in a normal program, so what we have to do is to interpret our data in the image generated by the shader. So, for example, as you notice here, I grabbed the UV coordinates and I split it in the X coordinate and the Y coordinate and in my final color I use the X coordinate to represent the color red and the Y coordinate to represent the color green. So for example if I were to this consider for now the Y coordinate of my UVs you would see that the resulted image is perfectly black at the left edge because this is where our uv.x is going to equal to zero and it's perfectly red at the right edge because this is the point at which uv.x is one which means that the color red has the highest intensity. Now the same thing would happen if instead of uv.x I would use uv.y as you can see because uv.y is zero at the top of my object, my color is black, and because uv.y is 1 at the bottom of the object, then the color is red. Okay, but what can these coordinates be used for? Well, a very common and actually the default use case of UVs is texture sampling. And by sampling, what I mean is simply that we are going to use these coordinates in order to pick a texture pixel or a texel for our current fragment. So, for example, for our fragment here at the position 0, 0, we are going to pick the texel that's at 0% horizontally and 0% vertically. If we were to check the middle fragment, which is at 0, 5, 0, 5, we would pick the texel that's at 50% horizontally and 50% vertically in our texture here. And finally, for 1, 1, we would pick the final texel at 100% in our texture. Now, I'm definitely sure you are paying attention because you noticed that I specifically used percentages here. And I did that because it really doesn't matter how large our texture is or how large our object is, the UV coordinates are always going to refer to coordinates percentage-wise. So even if I make my object larger, you will see that my texture still stretches to reach 100% here at the edge. All right, but we've been talking quite a lot about sampling textures, so let's actually see them in practice. Well, Godot provides us with a texture function, which allows us to get the color for the fragment at the current UV coordinate. So, first of all, a color has four channels, red, green, and blue, and finally an alpha channel. So, because of that, our element is going to be a vector 4. Now, let's maybe call it color, and let's say that this is equal to texture and in here we have to specify the actual texture that we are going to use so the physical like png or whatever texture we provided and the coordinates from which we pick the pixel from that texture now to get the actual texture that we have here at the top of our texture rect and actually to get the texture from the top of any canvas item that supports this texture field Godot has a built-in element called texture. So what I can do is to simply specify here texture and the next thing that I have to do is to specify the coordinates from which we sample that texture. So I'm simply going to paste here my UV coordinates and simply add a semicolon and now I can set this color instead of being UV to be this color that I sampled and as you can see it's the Godot icon. Alright, now before moving on, I want to ask you a question. What do you think would happen if, for example, I picked a UV that doesn't perfectly align with any of these texels? So for example, if I picked 0.21 and 0.3456, why not? Well, in that case, 
you might notice that my Godot logo here is a bit blurry. And this is happening because Godot has to get a bit creative and add a color that's basically a mix between the colors that are closest or the texels that are closest to this coordinate that I'm giving. And it's happening this way because if you look here at the texture of my canvas item, the filter mode is inherit, which by default is linear, and this creates this interpolation. But for example, what I could have done would have been to have the nearest filter, which as you can see changed how my texture looks, because now instead of like getting something in between, it's getting the closest value or the closest pixel to that coordinate. So yeah, by learning UVs, you now also learned how texture filtering modes work. All right, but the really fun part begins when we actually start playing with our UV values. And in order to showcase that, I'm going to simply duplicate this texture rect to have two of them here. And I'm going to create an instance parameter that allows us to see the UVs for one of the texture rects. So I'm just going to create instance uniform bool and call it C UV and make it equal to false by default, why not? And if we want to see UV, so if C UV, then the color is actually simply going to equal to a vector four of UV comma 0.0 comma 1.0. And now if I go to my second texture rects material, I maybe select it again and I see this instance shader parameters and if I set it to on, you see that I basically just have the UVs that are used for sampling this texture. Okay, now let's see what happens if I multiply our UVs by two. Well, it looks like our image here got smaller. Now, why is that? Well, before our UVs were sampling directly from this texture because they were ranging between 0, 0 and 1, 1. However, now because our UVs range between 0, 0 and 2, 2, what happens is that in the range 0, 1, everything is sampled as normal, and anywhere outside of this range, Godot doesn't really know what to do again, so what it does is just picking the latest pixel that it saw in our texture. And for example, here the last pixel is a blue and here the last pixel is something transparent. And yeah, we can also configure how that looks like by going, for example, to this and under texture, instead of repeat disabled, which is the inherited value, we could enable repeating. And as you can see now Godot, instead of like adding the latest pixel, simply just repeats everything. Or if I pick mirror, well, it's simply going to mirror everything. Okay, now leaving the repeat mode aside, let's see what else we can do. So for example, instead of getting the whole UV, what we could do would be to like take the elements separately. So I could do something like vec2 of uv.x and uv.y. So up until now, nothing special. However, what if I added a value to uv.x? Let's say that I add 0.5. As you can see, my whole image moved towards the left. And of course it moved to the left because my UVs now horizontally range between 0.5 and 1.5. And of course, just as before, between 0.5 and 1, Godot knew what to do, but between 1 and 1.5, well, Godot doesn't have anything to sample, so it's simply going to take like the last thing that it gets from the edge of my texture. Okay, now taking a step back, if I were to be honest, the first time when I learned this, it wasn't very obvious to me why this is happening the way it is. And to me, it was quite confusing why multiplying something gives me an image that's smaller. I would expect when I multiply to get a larger image or so. So how did I get to finally understand this? Well, if we go again back to our image editor analysis, you can think of the UVs as the canvas on which you draw your images. So for example, you could make your canvas twice as large, and by doing that, of course, the image that you previously had there is going to look smaller. On top of that, you could take your canvas and move it 50% to the right, and of course, that the image you had previously there is moved 50% to the left. 
But on top of all the amazing features that a canvas has in an image editing program, shaders and UVs support many more transformations than just like moving around or scaling the canvas. So for example, you can say scale the canvas, just <laughs> as I mentioned before, you can transform the canvas so you can move things around. You can rotate the canvas or the UVs. You can flip the UVs, as you can see here. But you can also like repeat them and warp them and put them in polar coordinates. Like this is very interesting because, <laughs> yeah, it's doing this trippy, fancy effect. Or we can even distort them by using some kind of texture. Speaking of distortion, you could also think of the UV as the paper on which we put our image or our texture. And despite the texture staying the same, if we crumble our paper or distort the UV, the final result is going to look different. Now, of course, we are going to get over all of this uh, in quite a few videos probably, but I just want to show you that the power we have with UVs is much larger than the power we would have with a normal canvas in a normal image editing program. Alright, but before reaching the end, I just want to show you some more examples so that you can get the gist of what working with UVs is like. So if I were, say, to check the current coordinates and do something against it, let's say that I want to check if something is above the diagonal or below it, I could do something like if uv.y is larger than uv.x, then I want to have the simple color that I sampled here from my texture. And otherwise, I would like to simply not have anything. To simply not have anything, I can use the discard keyword. So I can write discard. As you can see, now everything that has the y value larger than the x value, and remember that y grows the more I approach the bottom part of my sprite. So everything in this region is going to get rendered. But everything that's outside of this region, everything that has a Y smaller than X, is not getting rendered. So basically I simulated like a slice for my object here. And this check that I have here is quite simple. But for example, instead of this, what I could apply would be something like this, which, don't worry, we are going to get over functions in the next video actually, but we could apply something like this and you see that I can make this cool wave effect and I can like divide it by four or change the parameters and you see that I get this varying <laughs> rendering of my sprite just by adding this function here. Okay, now let's see another cool effect. I'm not sure if you heard of chromatic aberration, but that is an effect that you get when a lens is not functioning properly in a camera and the color channels don't quite overlap. So how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, let's erase what we have here so that we lose the wave and let's sample our texture again, but with a slight offset. So let's simply make a uniform float offset and let's make it equal to 0 0.01, why not by default? And if I sample this texture again, so I'm just going to copy this twice, let's say color two and color three. If I sample this texture again, I want to get it from UV plus offset. And in this case, I want to get it from UV minus offset. Okay, and what do we do with that? Well, if you take a look at color two, it seems that when we sampled, we, because we added something to the UV, the image moved a bit to the top left. Now, if we were to look at color 3, because we subtracted something from the UV, the image went a bit to the bottom right. Okay, but how does this help us? Well, what we could do instead of using a singular color would be to use a channel from each of these colors. So I could create a new color, which is a vector 4, that takes as inputs what? Well, for the red channel, I would take the color.r. For the green channel, I would take color2.g. And for the blue channel, I would take color3.b. And then for the alpha, let's just take the color alpha, so color.a. And as you can see, I have this very interesting effect that I can change based on this offset to give the vibe of an old or broken camera. And yeah, something very subtle like this is going to <laughs> create like this really, really nice effect. And this was just done by sampling the texture multiple times and basically overlapping it and picking the different channels from each different overlap. 
Okay, now as a final thing, I told you that we can not only sample the original texture of our node here, but we can sample any kind of texture. So for example, I could say here that I have a uniform sampler 2D and call it text, and I could set this text to be anything. I could set it to be, for example, a noise texture, and for this noise texture, I could select fast noise light, and now I have this like random noise. So instead of using the texture, I could be using text here that I just defined. So if I replace texture with text, you see that I am no longer sampling from this texture that I defined here, but I am sampling from the noise texture that I have here on the right. Now, another special texture that I have is the texture of the screen. Like, for example, I could literally get like an image of the screen and use that as a texture for my object, basically making my object sort of transparent. But the benefit of that is that I can add any kind of effect through this shader to the whole screen. And this is very, very useful for when you want to add like post-processing or filters or something like that. So let's say that I wanted to add this chromatic aberration filter to everything on the screen. Well, or maybe to a region defined by this rectangle. Well, I only need to sample the screen texture. Now to do that, we have a special hint to our editor, and that is the hint screen texture. It's kind of obvious. So what I could do is again, write uniform sampler 2D and screen text. And this has to be hinted to the editor as hint screen texture. Now, when the editor sees this hint, it's not going to add the screen text to my parameters here. So for example, if I add here a semicolon, you see that I don't have this under my parameters. This is because the editor already knows that hint screen texture refers to the screen. So of course I'd no longer have to configure anything to it. But what if I still wanted to change some things? What if I wanted to, just as before, change the filtering or the repeat of my texture? Well, I could just specify it in code. I could, for example, write here, repeat disable so that the texture doesn't repeat. And I could also say filter linear. These are just the same parameters that I've had here, but I added to my hint screen texture, but you could have simply left this to hint screen texture without any change at all. All right, and now if we finally take the screen texture and put it in place of the original texture, well, something's a bit weird. First of all, everything is moving inside of this little square. Maybe let's make it larger. And second of all, uh, it's kind of weird. I expected the rectangle to simply show what's behind it, but for some reason, it's like mapping the whole screen inside of this rectangle. Why is this happening? Well, this is happening because the UVs that I set for sampling these textures are the UVs tied to my object here. So because this is 0% and this is 100%, what I'm getting at this point is 100% of the screen texture. So this point here on the screen. So what if I wanted to get precisely this zone from the screen? Well, then instead of the UVs of my rectangle, I would need to use the UVs or the coordinates of the whole texture rectangle. So what I'd have to do is to use not UV, but another built-in which gives me the coordinates of the whole screen, which is called screen UV. So just to repeat, UV coordinates of the object, screen UV coordinates of the screen. It's not such big of a deal. But if I now move my object, you see that the filter is being applied and maybe I can make it a bit more subtle. Yeah, the filter is being applied over everything that my window here is uh, overlapping. All right, now we're really getting into it. Now, what I want from you is to do the exercises that I have attached here in this video, because practicing this is going to be your best friend in learning shaders. Now, the video also contains the solutions, so I'm not going to leave you stranded, don't worry. But I would urge you to try doing the exercises yourself first. Okay, but the video has been long enough, so thanks a lot for watching, thanks a lot to my supporters, and see you in the next one. Bye-bye! Ha, ha, ha.